Point Blank is a crime fiction podcast. It may not be suitable for all listeners. We discuss violence in all its forms. The works we reference may include period slang, which some listeners may find offensive. The hosts also have a tendency to swear. Episode 7, The Black Masked Boys, by William Nolan. Welcome back to Point Blank, Episode 7. How's it going today, Justin? It is going quite well today. I think we wanted to talk about a movie that just came out. Yes, we did. Blade Runner 2049. Uh, You saw it last night, is that correct? Or a couple days ago? Yeah, I just saw it last night. You know, I was expecting it to be good. I had read a couple reviews or at least teasers about it. And, you know, just the general aesthetic of it looked like it was promising, but... I didn't expect it to be great, and walking out of the theater, I thought it was great. Yeah, I would have to agree. I mean, I I really enjoyed it. Um, It isn't perfect, but there is a lot of there's a lot of good stuff. And maybe first of all, we should say, well, this is a noir podcast, and some people get really strict about their noir definitions. But I've always considered the original Blade Runner to be the quintessential neo noir movie. No, and I'm. Yeah, and I'm not alone in that. And it was great to see that this new version, I mean, if anything, it amped it up a little bit, I thought, for certain scenes. I mean, the story wasn't quite as tight, but some of the noir elements felt uh, perhaps even stronger to me. Yeah, I mean, they had a longer running time, but it feels like there was a conscious effort to play up the aesthetics and the atmosphere of of the original that, yes, the characters and the story and the questions of what is human, what is not, all those are still important pieces, but it's that atmosphere from the first one, the rainy, dark, sort of seedy Los Angeles of the future. That's that's what draws people, and that's what sort of burns into the mind of the viewer. And I love that aesthetic. It's the aesthetic that make, made me fall in love with hard-boiled detectives and, and, and such. And yeah, this film, this not remake, but sequel, uh, plays that stuff up almost like as if they're doing fan service, but in a way that doesn't feel overwrought or or unnecessary. Like you said, the city is, you know, is so central to the story. The rain is pounding. The weather, actually, not just rain in this one. Yeah. The weather is so bleak. And I mean, you've got rain, snow, wind, radiation, I believe, poisoning, I believe. Um, it's, you know, it's just... And it, it's advanced that timeline a little bit further. And boy, you know, one of the comments that was made um, about the film was that in the first one, there's actually quite a few like of the cars flying around. Sure. And by the t- time of this one, there really aren't. Things have gotten worse. Yeah. Um, I think I think what you said about the the weather is part of that. I really liked how this sequel showed climate changing or you know the environmental effects of whatever catastrophe had occurred in the past you you see the evolution uh, of that in 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 the way the the weather looks in the landscape and even the character of the city itself it's fun to see like how the chronology of uh, of of the disaster and and its aftermath and i think they were very conscious of that they sort of played into that i think for example the snow was a product of that sort of change yeah for sure and you know they the interesting thing, and this is just something when you mentioned the climate change that, uh, I don't know, just played in my head, but I see this really as there's a lot of critique of technology in both of these films. And it, it actually going back to some of the classic stories that we're talking about, we're also looking at a period where there's a lot of technological change and how people adapt to those things. Like even thinking of, you know, the big sleep, like the big conundrum and the big sleep of, you know, these photos being taken. Well, if you didn't have photography uh, that the average home user could use, that wouldn't have been an issue. Sure. And then now here, we've advanced this technology and it causes all these new problems for society. And actually, you know, some of the same exploitations of, um, well, in this case, both workers, who is a worker and women in society. And I thought it, the, the movie did a really good job of, I guess, portraying the potential dangers of those technological changes. Think of the automatic weapon. Think about Tommy guns. Think about every step of the way. Of course, there's also legalistic things and historical things that are occurring, uh, you know, prohibition and such. But 
the fact that at every stage when the technology develops to another level, the atom bomb, radio, etc., you have a new situation that develops and we make choices as characters and as people and as a culture where we're going to go. And these decisions aren't always easy. And yeah, that's a lot of what Blade Runner is grappling with, these those questions about genetics and, and virtual reality and all those types of things that, you know, I think it's well done. I think it's well played. Yeah. And for that reason, I mean, I think that's where Blade Runner, both of them succeed is because just like a great piece of science fiction writing or a great piece of crime fiction writing, it's really, you know, going back to why I'm motivated by this genre is it's putting that mirror on society and forcing us to think about some of those potential choices that we make. And I mean, this one, I, this movie, I think does it very well. It's, it, and as a noir story, I mean, it's bleak throughout. It starts rough. It ends rough and it leaves you thinking. So if you haven't had a chance to see the film, you know, by the time we're, we just saw it, it was in theaters. By the time this airs, it's probably well on its way to, uh, streaming and DVD release. So if you haven't checked it out, I would highly recommend it. And it's time once again for Five Round Burst. Five Round Burst is when we do five short reviews in about five minutes. And today we we actually have a kind of heavy anthology uh, collection, which works with our main topic. So, well, first of all, Justin, I want to ask you, are you a fan of Johnny Cash? Yes, that's the short answer. That, that is the short answer. That's fair. All right. Well, yes, I should start off with number one, and that is the anthology... Just to Watch Them Die. This came out in 2017 by Gutter Books, and it's edited by Joe Clifford. And now, I love this. This is crime fiction inspired by the songs of Johnny Cat. I love this. This, to me, is what is some of what the best of crime fiction can be. It's modern. It's interesting. It has a variety of characters, and the subject of the anthology is, is really top. I mean, I just... A great idea for an anthology. Really good. I mean... It, there was maybe one or two stories in here that didn't didn't quite work for me, but I mean, it's minor quibbles. This was really good. If you're listening to this podcast and you are at all a fan of Johnny Cash, then you're going to want to check out Just to Watch Them Die. It's top-notch stuff here. This is the man in black uh, hitting a bullseye in the middle of a ring of fire. I mean, it's, it's good. Check this out. All right. Up next, uh, number two, we have another anthology. This is New Orleans Noir, The Classics, and this came out in 2016 from Akasic Books, and it's a part of their global uh, city noir series. This one is edited by Julie Smith, and it is a classics collection, not a new collection. So the stories come from, uh, they start in 1843 and go up to 2013. And you've got such uh, you know classic authors as O. Henry and Tennessee Williams, uh, and more modern authors like James Lee Burke. And, you know, the, the city of New Orleans, the Big Easy, I mean, if that also is another place that just screams crime fiction and gothic literature, and this was a good collection from Akasic. I mean, you had a lot of material to pull from, from such an iconic city, and a good, another solid uh, hit, really enjoyed this. And I also enjoyed the fact that of the time span, to see some of the changes in the style and the changes in the city of New Orleans, which is a city I, I visit, a, well, fairly often for work. So I really enjoyed this. That was a hit. Number three is a little bit of more of a unique choice here. This is called Noir Riot. Uh, it was published in 2014, also from Gutter Books. And um, this is this is a con book. This was published for Noir Con, which is a, I believe, every other year convention. And one of the things that's interesting about convention books that I've found is a lot of times you get short stories from authors who are involved in the convention. These stories aren't necessarily ones that are going to get published somewhere else. It gives them a little more freedom to write what they want and uh, play around with the work a little more than you would in a, in a, in a different type of anthology. So this was another another good one for me. Um, there's some fun stories. There's a nice one from Ken Bruin in here. There's also a lot of noir poetry, which is not necessarily something I would have, you know, thought of. But they got it for this book. So if that's interesting to you, it's in here. This one is a. It's also a hit for me. But this is more like a, a glaze to the leg, maybe. You know, I just need to put a band aid on this thing. Uh, but it is a hit. I mean, it was fun. It's a small volume. That is Noir Riot. 
Next up, we have a actually a graphic novel, and this is The Fade Out. This was published in 2015 by Image Comics. It's by Ed uh, Brubaker and Sean Williams, and the art is by Elizabeth, I'm going to butcher her last name here, Brett Weiser, I believe. Really, if, if you want to change up your reading, you want to take a look at some of these graphic novels, there are some great noir and crime graphic novels out there, and most of them are penned by Ed Brubaker. You, I have not read a miss from him at all uh, of the graphic novels. And the, the, this one takes place in Hollywood in 1948. It involves you know kind of a similar story that we've seen before in noir films. This one is about a writer of noir films, and then there's a suspicious death of an actress, and of course things go crazy from there. Nice clean writing. I like the art. It invokes the image. It's maybe not my favorite kind of comic art, but the writing is top notch, and uh, for that, that's a hit. And last up, our nonfiction selection for this week is Queen of the Underworld by Sophie Lyons. Now, this was originally published in 1913, and this this copy that I have was uh, republished in 2013 by Combustion Books, and this is the real-life biography of this woman, Sophie Lyons, and she was, as the title says, a queen of the underworld, and it has real stories of uh, bank robberies, prison breaks, swindles, and con artists, and, um, you know, in this thing, even if half of the stuff that she says in here is true, it is a fascinating read. You know, some of the storytelling, she's not a professional author, although I'm sure there was some kind of ghostwriter in this or whatever. The writing is maybe not as strong as you might want, but these are real stories, uh, or supposedly real stories, and I love this time period of crime, the late 1800s, the early 1900s. It's just really uh, a fun look into that that history of the underworld. So, Queen of the Underworld by Sophie Lyons, that's a hit. And with that, I guess we'll go on to the main topic. For a main topic this episode, we're discussing the Black Mask Boys, Masters in the Hard-Boiled School of Detective Fiction. This is an anthology that was written and edited, I guess mostly edited, by William F. Nolan. Nolan is an American author. He, he writes fantasy, sci-fi, crime fiction. He writes a lot of reviews, and he does a lot of anthologies like the one that we're looking at this, this time around. He also is known for the Logan Run series, which was books and then became, I think, a, a hit TV show in the 70s, which I did not watch. In this book, we have eight Black Mask stories from the early days of Black Mask. Most of them hadn't been published ever or for a long time until this book came out in 1985 by Mysterious Press. And in this book, Nolan also writes a nice intro essay on the history of Black Mask, which we'll explore in some detail. And he also offers what he calls behind-the-mask introductions for each of the authors featured in the anthology. Let me tell you briefly about the authors, uh, and then I'll give you a quick review of the book, and then we'll move on and talk about specific stories from the book that we really liked or we really thought were interesting. So this is a slightly different type of introduction than we've been doing for these novels. So the eight authors. We have, first off, we have Dashiell Hammett. His story in this is called Bodies Piled Up, and it features the Continental Op of Red Harvest fame. This is almost like a locked door mystery. I really loved it. Uh, there's impersonation. There's a story in a story. There's double villains, inverted numbers. It's really fun and really tightly written, and I could see why Hammett became the model for a lot of future Black Mask detective fiction. Another author that we're not going to discuss in, in depth today is Frederick Nebel. He's a self-taught writer and autodidact. Apparently, he sold 300 stories to magazines over the course of his literary career, and he's not very well known. The editor, Joe Shaw, tried to get Nebel to agree to having some of his work published in a retrospective on the on the magazine, and he refused. Nebel didn't want to be a part of it, and as a result, we just don't know much about him. He has a story in here featuring his private eye, Donahue, who's an Irish uh, American from New York, and he goes to St. Louis to seek out and, and hunt down a, a thief, essentially. And he's known as Bogart in a Straw Hat. He's a good character. I, I really enjoyed it, but uh, we're not going to be spending too much time with that story today. Another author that we're not exploring is Raoul Whitfield, and his story features a character called Sal the Dude. It ends with an airplane duel. A lot of his books have Hollywood settings, 
I didn't care for this story very much. I'm not going to talk much about it. I'll leave it at that. Another author is Paul Kane, whose real name is Peter Rurik. And he wrote Fast One, which Kurt reviewed uh, a while back. In this story, he has a tough guy. His name is Doolin. And this is classic, hard-boiled, 20s era action. There's a, a lot of a lot of fast talk, a lot of trouble. I really enjoyed this story. I think it was pretty well written. And last but not least, we have Raymond Chandler. He ends the collection aptly. He was one of the last major Black Mask fiction writers who was well-established to join the foray. He didn't start writing for the magazine until the 30s. In this case, we have a PI, his predecessor to Marlowe, who goes by the name of Mallory. But essentially, they're the same. Every every time he wrote a PI, no matter what name he gave him, uh, it was essentially Marlowe. The Knight. So in this story, it's Blackmailers Don't Shoot. It's a really good story, really engaging plot. Uh, it's classic Chandler dialogue and figurative language. I really liked it. I thought the the bookends of Dash Hammett and Chandler were important uh, in terms of framing this Black Mask collection. If I had to rate this collection, I would give it four hits. I thought it had a good history of the Black Mask magazine. And as an anthology, it features some better known Black Mask authors, but mixes it up with some that I didn't know so well in a way that made me give equal time and attention to all eight of the of the stories. Yeah, I, I think I would give it the same rating as you did. I'd say it's a four out of five, mostly because it does give that overview of Black Mask magazine. Some of these stories are just solid. I mean, we could have totally talked about the bodily, Bodies Piled Up story by Hammett. We could have had an interesting discussion of the Chandler piece. I would have really enjoyed talking about Paul Kane as well. I think he might be somebody we need to do a full episode on. A lot of solid stuff here, but I also thought that there were a couple of like, why is this in this collection, especially when you're limiting it to eight? Maybe that's uh, Saul the Dude or Sal the Dude. That one was kind of like a kind of a miss for me, especially considering the author talked about how Raul Whitfield had a number of solid pieces. I don't know if this was a licensing issue or or something along those lines. Just a couple of quick comments about this book. What I did like a lot was the biography of the author before for the short piece. And in a lot of ways, that's kind of what we're doing on this show. Overall, what I thought was, except for one exception, <laughs> one thing I thought interesting about these authors is so many of them had incredibly exceptional lives. They traveled around the world at a time when that wasn't necessarily common. They had a variety of jobs. Everything here from like Lumberjack in the Canadian North Woods to Tramp Steamer crew member to World War I flying ace. And that part of it really stuck out to me that, the, that some of these people were really, you know, they're writing these pulp adventure detective stories from a place of, you know, something they had some experience with. So for that part, I, I really gained more of an appreciation for the people who were, were writing these stories. The, the difficulty that these authors face trying to stitch together a career in the field of writing, of course, it's not much easier these days. In fact, it might even be more difficult because nobody pays for writing anymore. But the fact is, uh, it wasn't easy to scrape by working as a writer in this genre fiction. They're not teaching on the side. They're not professional editors. A lot of them are just scrapping together these sort of hard-boiled lives as they put together their careers. And some of them, you know, I'm surprised to find the, the success to which they, they, they managed to, to reach. Uh, like Earl Stanley Gardner, for example, we'll talk about. You know, the other thing that impressed me about a lot of these authors is their sheer output. Neville, like writing 5,000 words a day. When he went to write something that was a little bit longer, he just scaled back his short story writing to uh, three novelettes a month. So he's writing a novel in three novelettes a month. <laughs> Earl Stanley Gardner, too, like some of these writers were unstoppable. A lot of times it was just because of, of the rat race of the industry and how you get paid for for a word count uh, or story by story basis. So you have to produce if you want to pay the bills. I mean, that's part of it, but that doesn't mean that, that it's any easier. That actually, in fact, makes more pressure on you as a, as a human being to be able to maintain that output for longs. I think we're really seeing the cream of the crop here. Well, let's t let's talk about who's paying for this writing. Talk about Black Mask. Sure. If you know any title of a pulp magazine, it's probably Black Mask. It started publication in 1920, and then it would cease publication in 1951. 
When it stopped publishing in 1951, they would have published over 2,500 stories from 640 different authors in 340 issues and over 30 million words in print. Briefly, with the magazine, it should be said, was brought back for just a couple of years in the 80s, but it didn't really sustain it. And now you'll see the uh, the name Black Mask used more as a anthology publisher. Uh, someone does have the copyright on the Black Mask name. But it, its origins start in 1920. It was never meant to be anything. The fact that we're talking about it here is probably a shock to its founders, the, the initial publishers. One name in particular is, should be well known to at least some of you, H.L. Mencken, who was an editor and literary writer of the time. He was one of the publishers and the other was George Nathan. And they'd started Black Mask, or in its early incarnation, The Black Mask, as a way to make money for their more important literary publication called The Smart Set, which we don't know much about, but we now know Black Mask as seminal work that really got a lot of these hard-boiled writers into writing and, and established their careers. I mean, this was a pulp publication, which, you know, pulp is like the cheap paper, the paper that's been all ground up and reconstrued, wasn't meant to last. It was stuff that's going to dissolve in, in, in a light rain. So they weren't expecting much to come of this magazine. They were just looking for a quick money maker. They they were gone within six months. They sold the magazine for 12250 bucks, which given that they invested only 500 bucks in the project to start, they walked away with hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in current money. Mencken hated the Black Mask. He called it a lousy magazine. So there was no love uh, between the initial publishers and their creation. That didn't last, of course. There were some people who came into the fold who changed the way that Black Mask was presented and also came in with a passion to make it the best magazine possible. But that's not how it started. But isn't that interesting how that story of like, well, this is just a way to make a quick buck to publish my more literary magazine. Isn't that interesting how that parallels so many of the writers that we've looked at who are struggling to become literary writers and they're like, well, I'll just try this crime fiction thing to make a quick buck. And that's what they end up being remembered for. There's an interesting tension there about uh, what we aspire to be and what we end up with and how sometimes we don't realize that the success we are, we are seeking is right beneath our nose. So, yeah, yeah, those new owners or new, the new owners with new editors, they really brought Black Mask into its prime. And the, the editors at that time were, uh, well, at first Philip C. Cody and then the more um, more well-known Joseph Shaw. They would bring in what Black Mask truly is known for. And it'd be interesting here to read off a few of the writers that they end up publishing. We've got the ones we've, we've covered already. Dashiell Hammett and Raymond Chandler, the ones we're talking about today, Earl Stanley Gardner, Paul Kane, Raul Winfield. Later on, another editor, Fanny Ellsworth, would bring in Cornell Woolrich, Max Brand, John D. McDonald, and not to be left out, and I think this is an important thing about Black Mask is that we often view this as a male writer only, male readership only uh, publication. And we found some evidence in this book that that's not, not the case. We have female writers like Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, Sally Wright, Marion O'Hearn, and Dorothy Dunn. Plus, the first editor of the magazine was a, was a woman named Florence Osborne, who was credited as F.M. Osborne in the magazine. She was the first editor of Black Mask, not the only woman, though. There was a woman down the road who ended up assuming the mantle uh, after Shaw. But really, Black Mask didn't become what it is until Shaw, also known as Captain Shaw or Joseph Shaw, assumed the editorial role in the mid-1920s. Uh, there's some argument that he made Black Mask what it is, but there are also dissenters who claim that he, he inherited a pretty solid stable of writers and a, a, a pretty well-established magazine in the sense that people were already reading it. But what he did was nurtured Dash Hammett. He said Dash Hammett was the model that we need to ascribe to. He actually created a system where other writers needed to write using the Hammett formula. In 1927, he penned an editorial. The name of the editorial was The Aim of Black Mask. And in this, he asserted Black Mask's definite purpose with the goal of Black Mask being the only magazine of its kind in the world. And I think whether or not you have good writers or a good magazine, the idea of having somebody who's committed to a particular style and focus and is willing to keep 
and tailor the magazine along that path for an extended period of time really is what gave it the definition. You know, when we think of Black Mass now, we think of a certain style that was Shaw refining and trimming down what it contained because the magazine at first wasn't detective, hard-boiled. It was everything. One of the early subtitles for the magazine was Illustrated Magazine of Detective Fiction, Adventure, Romance, and Spiritualism, which, I mean, what the fuck? It's everywhere. And they were just trying, and there was Westerns, like there was a time when Westerns played a big role. Everything gets in, any genre we're we're good with. And it took a while for them to start to hone in and leave out some of that. I mean, what the hell is spiritualism uh, in the context of of short stories? I don't know what that is. Well, yeah, that's, I mean, that is interesting that it was this catch-all. And I mean, like you say, you know, they're just throwing anything out there that people will read and seeing what sticks. Lucky for us, it was the detective fiction that stuck. You mentioned uh, Shaw's focus. And, you know, just to, to look, take a look at the, the playing field that they were up against here, there is at least 200 other magazines that were printing basically the same thing at the same time. Other than the scholars of this, you're not going to see a collection from um, the, the 1920s uh, magazine Crime Busters on the shelf at your local Barnes & Noble, but you are going to find a Black Mass collection. You know, a lot of these had really generic names. Like I said, Crime Busters, Nickel Detective, Pocket Detective. Some of them were a little little more interesting, like Gun Malls or The Octopus, Spicy Detective Adventures. That sounds pretty, pretty racy there. To talk about Joe Shaw a little bit more, he wrote upon reading Dash Hammett's work, he wrote that Hammett brought the magazine his distinctive form. He set character before situation and led others along that path. That's important because the idea of making sure that characters are the centerpiece of your fiction, he really set the stage for these nuanced, interesting, developed characters that become series characters. Not just the PIs, though, also McCoy's Flying Ranger and Raoul Whitfield. I haven't read any of this, but he had a character called Joe Gar from his Island Detective Stories, which sounds to me like one of our real stupid mysteries. (laughs) Yes, it does. And then we have Jerry Frost, who we'll talk about in a little while, who's not only a a World War II flying ace, but also like this hard-boiled badass. Anyway, these are recurring series characters. We get to know who they are and get a little bit more of their personality. And that's something that Shaw really emphasized. I mean, obviously, it was a successful sales technique because people are going to return to the characters that they like. I don't remember exactly which character. I think it was a Hammett or Chandler character. But I remember when reading that when a Hammett character was on the cover of Black Mask, they would sell like three times the number of copies. It raises the question, why do we read? Why are we drawn to these entertainments? Uh, What do they add to our life? And a lot of times we're looking for a connection. And these stories, these characters, they're additives to our life. It's a one-way street, but there's a relationship that happens there. And you can't have that relationship if you're limited to only a a few dozen pages with somebody. It, It breaks off too soon. So I can see the reasons why, like psychologically, we're drawn to that. But of course, you have to have a character who's worth spending time with. I'm going to say one more thing about Shaw, uh, one of the writers from his stable, wrote in 1935 that it was important to Shaw that the magazine be respected. He needed to believe that he was editing a publication of real importance, and he took his job very seriously. He loved what he did, and this that passion that fueled the development and success of the magazine. You talk about the legitimacy that Shaw um, was looking for, and I had a quote here that you know he was always really adamant about who was reading the magazine, and that he would defend it against the people who were like, "Well, it's just trash. It's just trash." Well, and he would say, "No, you know, our readership, you know, we have documented readership from letters to the publication from clergy, bankers, lawyers, and doctors." It was pretty clear that he was seeing this as a professional magazine, as a genuine literary style that should be taken seriously. Thankfully, from his editorial hand, we can see that development in somebody, especially like Chandler, who's taking that, uh, you know, another step further. If it hadn't been for uh, somebody like Shaw influencing Hammond and, and the rest of the writers in his stable to create that kind of fiction, you know, maybe it would have just stayed as as kind of trashy, cheap stuff. Who knows? And the question then would be what? would have become of the detective story, private eye, hard-boiled, noir. Obviously, no single person is responsible for the creation of these genres. It was part of the gestalt of the time. It was the the world wars. And, you know, there was a, a darkness that was motivating and inspiring a lot of this literary work. But Joseph Shaw shaped and promoted Hammett. 
He inspired other writers to be like Hammett. Chandler was deeply inspired by what he read of Hammett in Black Mask. Chandler joined the fold to work with Shaw and produce, you know, and elevate the type of writing that Hammett was doing. And then when Shaw got fired 10 years into his tenure with Black Mask, Chandler quit. Had Shaw not been there, what would have happened with Hammett? He might have he might not have developed his career, which would then not have inspired Chandler to write and to, and to strive in the way that he did. We might just be stuck with this terrible poetry. I do want to read it. It's a rather lengthy quote, but it's from the introduction to this book, Black Mask Boys. And I think it, it speaks to the influence of the magazine. The Black Mask and the fiction it printed grew directly out of the era between the two world wars when machine guns flash fire from low-slung black limousines, when the corner speakeasy served rot-gut gin, when swift run-runners made night drops in dark coastal waters, when police and politicians were as corrupt as the gangsters they protected, when cons and crooks prowled New York alleys and lurked in trackside hobo jungles, when Dillinger and Pretty Boy Floyd and Al Capone made daily headlines and terrorized a nation. The Black Mask Boys wrote it as it happened. Their fiction captured the cynicism, the bitterness, the disillusionment, and the anger of a country fighting to survive the evils of prohibition and the economic hardships of the Depression. The stories in Black Mask are born of adversity, written to dramatize and to delineate a nation in flux. A fast-paced, action-packed mysteries of today are a direct byproduct of what has become known around the world as the Black Mask School. The elegant, deductive sleuth, the calm, calibrating shifter of clues gave way to a new breed, the wary, wisecracking knight of the 45, an often violent, always unpredictable urban vigilante fashioned in the rugged frontier tradition of the Western gunfighter. In the pages of Black Mask, the private eye was born. That's a good quote. It's true. Black Mask was important. We're talking about it because of its value as a incubator and nexus for a lot of the stuff we talk about in this podcast. Now, I want to say it isn't like the Black Mask is only good. There's some bad shit about it, too. And I'm not just talking about writing. Uh, let's talk about racism. There is al- allegations that the journal was racist. This doesn't surprise me, uh, given the era. But one, one author, E.R. Hagman, who wrote uh, History of Black Mask and Mystery Magazine in 1981, he wrote, simply put, Mask was racist and used Chinese in stories and on covers derogatorily. Almost always they were villains. Blacks, if they appeared at all, were rendered as clowns. So, I mean, this is an allegation, which I wouldn't be surprised if it was uh, accurate for most of the tenure of Black Mask, the way that Anglo characters are put in pedestals and the way that not only minorities and people of color, but also women were used as these two-dimensional derogatory type of characters. That's something that needs to be acknowledged. Obviously, very true. And I mean, that is something that's glossed over a lot in uh, looking back at really any of this pulp fiction, whether it's detective fiction, adventure fiction, or the early sci-fi and fantasy. I mean, a lot, almost all of it has (laughs) massive problems when it comes to race and gender issues. I think we should do a topic on that in the future, probably sooner rather than later. Just how comparable this is to society overall. Is it mirroring society at the time or is it worse? It's a good question. I think you're you're right about having a exploration of gender in early detective fiction and exploration of race. Those would be interesting and possibly fun and, and contentious episodes. I know it's a hot debate because if you look at like one of the, the key elements, you know, the femme fatale, for example, there are definitely people who see that as rightfully in many cases as an exploitation of women. And then there are other people who argue that, no, this is actually a progression in feminism to actually have a, a character like that. So, you know, I, I think it's a good discussion uh, for another time. I think it's good to move into a few of the stories that we want to focus on. We're going to start with Three Gun Terry by Carol John Daly. And this is the first ever published story featuring a private investigator. That's, in fact, why I bought this collection a few months ago. I saw that this was the only place to get this first PI story, and I really wanted to see where where did Chandler, where did Hammett come up with this idea? What was the initial model? And it is Three Gun Terry, also known as, what the hell is his name? Terry Mack. Yes, Terry Mack. Girls love him because he's, quote, so brave and handsome. 
you have a do you have a summary for this one? Uh, well, you know, you if you want me to be honest, Justin, I had a really hard time reading this thing, so maybe you should do the summary. <laughs> okay, I'll I'll give a half ass summary because I have mostly bullet points. But we have okay, so three gun Terry. He's a long winded, cocky, brash, slingy, annoying, and illiterate. Plus, he's a superhero essentially. I guess it starts with there's a woman named Nita Gretna who's a Italian and she's just been freed herself from a convent and she's new to the United States. She's young and scared. So it's in a sense, sort of an immigrant story. There's a secret formula that needs to be found. It's almost like a MacGuffin, like a plot element that we don't really, that really just drives the story. But at the end, we actually find out that this formula has, it's pretty important and it ties into World War One. And so Terry has to like, get the girl and find the formula and get into fisticuffs with the, with a lot of guys. What else happens? This story's like 30 pages and it, it could have easily been written in like seven. In the end, he saves the girl. He sacrifices himself a bit. He gets the formula for poison gas. And then he lives to, uh, he doesn't get the girl. Actually, he gets the girl, but he doesn't. This is like the worst summary ever, but I don't care. That that's okay, Justin. The, I think the fact that you're having trouble with the summary here just speaks to how terrible this uh, this short story actually is. Yeah, it, I mean, let's be honest, listeners. This story is fucking terrible. It's it's just not good. No, I mean, unless unless you like your characters hard boiled to the point where they have no personality. Terry Mack is essentially a insecure braggart. He, he talks about how good he is at everything, and sure, he he wins the day, but it's a classic case of somebody who's still living in their parents' bedroom, not making money on their own and talking about how great they are. He doesn't actually get the girl in the end, which is funny because after all that work, she's she's connected to some other important person. And it's funny, the last line sort of sums up sort of his his psychological profile. And how did I take it? Why, like a gentleman that I am, I just went out and bought her the very best wedding present that the swellest pawn shop in the city could produce. And believe me, that little gift, marked with the best wishes of Terry Mack, would hold its own alongside anything that she got. So, (laughs) the dude, like, he's the best action hero. He's the best shot. He's the best. He's just the best dude. He's amazing at everything. And even when he loses, he's the best at getting somebody else that he loves a wedding present. Like, what a fucking loser. Well, you know, what I have to say about this is it's the first. And we should keep re repeating that it's yes. the first because that's about the best thing to say about this piece. And unfortunately, yes, there our first piece of hard boiled fiction is this. And then also this Carol John Daly also gives us the first hard boiled novel in The Snarl of the Beast, uh, which has a different character, Race Williams, who's basically the same guy. But the writing in this is, you know, if I wasn't saying that it was the first, that this writing is like if you took a middle school boy and gave him too much sugar and he had just decided that girls are pretty and then maybe maybe played football for the first time and thinks he's going to take out everybody and kiss all the girls and every, you know, just hyper the whole time. That's what this reads like. I mean, I, I, I believe there's probably middle schoolers who've written better stories than this. And the amazing thing that we talked about in here is that even though this is the first story, Carol John Daly basically writes this same story over and over and over again and never evolves as a writer, which is even more tragic, perhaps. I'm hard on the story, and I don't want to come across as too hard. This It's hard to be the first. And, and yeah, the writing isn't great. It's early Black Mask. There are some choice lines in the story. If you can get through all the braggart, self-absorbed, five-year-old, center of the universe bullshit, uh, there are moments when Carol Daly, the writer, shines through. For example, here's a paragraph, and at the end of it is a line that I really think is classic. I just dashed out of that room and up the stairs, my flash going full blast, and it was a good thing I had too, for it shines right on a lad sitting on the top of the stairs. Oh, he fired, yes, and I don't know what kind of a shot he was under ordinary circumstances. My light, a mighty powerful one too, had struck him right between the eyes, and he didn't see none too well, or he shot in a hurry. Anyway, he only shot once. None never do shoot more than once at me. I guess our guns spoke together. This typifies the type of language in the story. It's really slangy. It's very like intimate first person. Like It's just Terry Mack talking to us the whole time. A lot of the times when he's really good in this story, 
he's not really earning it. And I think that's part of the problem with this character. He thinks he's better than he really is. Like, for example, in this case, he's shining a flashlight in some dude's eyes. So the guy can't shoot him well because the flashlight is blinding him. But then Terry talks about how how much a better shooter he is than everybody else. He does this repeatedly. It's sort of like Carol is almost making fun of the character in a sense. Like, I'm going to get you the best darn wedding present because obviously, like, you can't be my girl because I'm not good enough. You have to go with somebody else. I'm a great shot, especially when I'm trying to shoot a blind man. Like, well, come on, dude. Obviously, there's a disparity here, but I guess our guns spoke together is a nice line. Yeah, that that's a nice line. He does have some, some good stuff in there. And what's interesting, too, is that Nolan, in his intro to the piece, he mentions how daily, you know, he basically produces what are instant cliches. So in this story, I mean, it's harder to read this now because so many of the things in here have been used a thousand times in a 10,000 different detective stories. But yeah, like you said, that's that's not a bad line. And he was a predecessor to Hammond. He was a predecessor to the style and it, whatever, you know, he wasn't a great writer. That's fine. Uh, he did create a great template for other writers to come in and improve upon. Unlike the other authors that we were exploring, like one's a lumberjack, one's out there fighting, fighting in the old West, one's on boats, one's a plain ace. Carol John Daly... He lived in the suburbs of New York. He like didn't leave his house. And when he did, he didn't go far. There's a story of him not wanting to go to the dentist. His teeth were rotting, but he was so afraid of pain that he just refused to go to the dentist. He was the exact opposite of this, these characters. You know, like how Chandler sort of wanted to embody this idea of Marlowe. Sure, he wasn't some badass like crime fighter, but it's this idea like where there's an embodiment of character, at least to some extent, with Hammett. You know, Hammett was a Pinkerton, so he models characters off some of his own experiences. John Daly had nothing. He just lived in his house and was afraid of the world, it seemed. It comes across in his characters. His characters feel untrue. Well, and I think that's kind of where I was getting at when I was talking earlier about the lives that a lot of these authors led. So many of them had exposure to thrilling things, you know. You could at least mold or, or change for these types of pieces, and... uh and Daly didn't really have that. He even lied about his height to uh, the publishers of Black Mass because it was said that they preferred to publish authors who were over six feet tall. <laughs> Which is hilarious. It's like having real good looking radio you know, announcers. It's just, it's an absurd, <laughs> but it speaks to his insecurities. And, yes. And it speaks to the importance of experience in creating good fiction, sort of like our discussion on Charles Williams. I really think experience does make the difference when it comes to quality writing. But, you know, given the fact that he didn't have have the experience, I mean, he sure uh, sure came up in his writing with a lot of ways to describe a bullet hitting a person. Um, yes. He was kind of known for that. He was known for these very colorful descriptions of how a, how a bullet uh, will enter a body. So, hey, you know, he was and you know what, for at least for a time, the readers loved him. They loved especially the character of Race Williams. Oh, here's here's a uh, quote here that it says when a Race Williams uh, title was on the cover, uh, there'd be a 15 percent rise in sales uh, for the issue. What would give Daly a lot of grief, I guess, later in life is that he basically feels that um, Mickey Spillane, right? Yes, Mickey Spillane. That's where I'm going. Mike Hammer is essentially the same character. Spillane, he stole my character. Now everybody loves Mike Hammer. He's rich. Like Spillane made it work, essentially. Whereas Carol's living in New York suburbs, not being famous and not being super awesome. So uh, I don't know. Have you read any of the Mike Hammer stuff? No, I'm a little skeptical. To I'm Mickey Spillane. It, it, it seems too one-dimensional for me but i mean we should address it at some point since it is such a major character but maybe maybe episode 47 we can do a a carol uh, a race williams versus mike hammer uh, you know showdown and uh, listeners who are keeping track at home uh, please feel free to send us all of the future episodes that we mentioned that we're doing in the uh, show um that'll be that's episode 47 we'll be doing a a throwdown there of daily and splain Yes. So make a note, folks, and, and make sure to read up. Uh, we have to keep track of these things. I'm thinking we should move on to story two now and uh, explore Earl Stanley Gardner, who's an interesting uh, author. And, yes. and uh, his story was pretty interesting, too. Yeah, let's move on to this story. Hell's Kettle, Hell's right? Hell's Kettle, yes. This is a 
Featuring Ed Jenkins, also known as the Phantom Crook. I like this story. How did you feel about it, Justin? <laughs> I like it. You know, the first read, I was like, what the hell is happening? It's all over the place. Uh, the second read, it started to so, sort of settle for me. And it's fun. The Phantom Crook is not like any of these protagonists. Uh, he's not a, not a detective, uh, not, not a cop. Sort of works in between cops and criminals, which is the typical sort of edges type of rogue that we've been reading about. A master of disguises, though, that's one of that's his special calling. And he certainly plays up the master of disguises in this story. I, I thought it was an interesting read. And there are some aspects of it which were confusing. Uh, there's also a Puss Walgreen in here that I'm, I'll talk about a little bit later. So what what did you think? Uh, you want to talk about the, the plot of this one a bit? You know, we have this, this uh, Ed Jenkins, and he basically sets up shop. Uh, he's using his disguises as in, you know, we do see a little bit of uh, black mass racism here. Yes. Because he dresses up as a Chinaman by doing some very st- stereotypical things. Uh, and then he sets himself up as a, uh, is it a doc colonel? He is a colonel, yes. Uh, colonel, colonel Grayson, an, an older gen- gentleman with a drinking problem. Yes. In, in a lot of ways, a little bit like in, I don't want, I guess in Red Harvest, um, he's sort of injected into this, like, to kind of cause trouble between these two factions. But the root of it is a little different, though, in that uh, Ed escapes from jail and he's wanted for murder. And he has some friends on the inside. Like, I think the DA conspires with him saying, like, we'll, we'll help you get out, but your job is to solve the crime. So it comes in with extra tension of having, he has to be a master of disguise, not only to get into the criminal underworld undetected, but also because the cops are sort of gunning for him. Yeah, I really did enjoy that part, uh, especially that we don't have just a, a straight up detective or a state straight up crook in this one. So yeah, he gets, he gets involved in all this and ends up at a, uh, basically a distribution point for uh, bootleg liquor and then chaos ensues. And we get a, a great action sequence and a big gunfight at the end, which I I thought that was pretty good. I, th- I liked the way that Gardner did the uh, the action there. Yeah, he really upped the ante. We had poison gas. We have mm-hmm. bullets flying, machine guns everywhere. We have fire. Yeah, I, I just enjoyed the, um, you know, it's pretty clear that, you know, they had the World War One surplus weaponry there that the bootleggers had. I enjoyed Gardner um, injecting that in there where, you know, rather than them just having a, a standard machine gun or some pistols or something. I really like how um, these first two stories and even maybe a lot of these Black Mass stories, how they're documents of history. We can read them and really get a, a sense of uh, the times, a lot of this, like you said, this World War One uh, weaponry, the consistent references to poison gas, two stories in a row now, there's a fear of gas or, or gas actually be playing a role. And that's coming out of, you know, the, the trenches and, and, the, and how that was such a, a huge impact on the psyche of humans at the time. It's just cool to sort of see these things play out in these fictional stories. Earl Stanley Gardner is a pretty good writer next, next to Next to Carol Daly, the story here is elevated. The the writing was pretty tight. There's some real good good moments of dialogue and, and clever transitions from, from scenes. I mean, you definitely see the professionalism of Gardner compared to Daly. But, you know, that's how Earl Stanley Gardner approached his entire life, pretty much. He is actually a lawyer in California. You know, he ends up taking to writing at, at a point and he looks at writing not only as a professional pursuit, but he also looks at it as a business pursuit. And he's, you know, looking at it from a marketing standpoint. Gardner's output is crazy. He's best known for something we don't think of as particularly hard-boiled, the Perry Mason. This guy's just astounding. He was known as being short, stocky, and virile. And I would say definitely the virility comes to play when it, when, it, when you think about his production. Few of these writers already have established professional careers you know, you, you hear about that now, you know, Grisham, and you get some of these writers who started off as a lawyer or a, a doctor, and then they become writers, and they have this expertise to talk about their, their their trade. Gardner was one of the first to do that. Of all these writers, including Chandler, Gardner achieved the most fame. He made the most money. He sold the most books. He had a famous television show. In 1970, he was the most widely read of all American writers. Like, this this stuff is all new to me. Well, well, and it's also interesting. I mean, I had heard his name, and I knew he wrote Perry Mason. But I, you know, I think of Perry Mason as something my grandparents would have on TV. Yeah. And it was, by that point, it's a much more, you know, also based on the age of the character, but it's a much more 
low-key crime courtroom drama, whereas the early Perry Mason was more like a lawyer who threw his fists around. And I wonder if they, I wonder if uh, that isn't a little bit true of Earl Stanley Gardner as well. I'd love to actually read one of those early Perry Mason and see how hard-boiled it was. But Gardner himself, he wasn't just a, a stuffed shirt lawyer. He fought for the rights of, of the working class, and which is interesting because this story has um, some racism racism in it in the way that it portrays Chinese folk. But uh, he, one of his first jobs was fighting for the rights of the Chinese working class in Oxnard, California. So he came in with like this sort of social justice angle. That's something he actually returned to later on in life. So I really like that aspect of the pie that makes up who Gardner is. Like this one slice of it was this determination to help help the little guy, you know? Once he was established and famous as hell, Perry Mason was rolling, he started this thing called the Court of Last Resort, which was an organization that reopened old criminal cases of the wrongly convicted and helped to free prisoners. Then this is before the era of DNA, so he just took this on as a as a side project while while still writing like one hundred thousand words a month or something. This guy was nuts. You know, when I first read that, I was kind of like, "Well, is he just looking at a market that needed to be exploited?" But then, when you look at his later in life, this court of last resort, you think, "Well, no, he probably actually was looking at the fact that everyone needs legal representation, and here's a community that isn't isn't being served properly." Really, I mean, basically, he starts the Innocence Project. Yeah. It'd be interesting to read a biography of him at some point. I'm, I'm guessing he actually putting his money where his mouth was in this case. He was no slouch, that's for sure. No. And, you know, speaking of that, you mentioned his output, but for 10 years, this is a quote from him, for 10 years, I kept up the pace of 100,000 words a month. I, I don't, I can't even, I mean, I, I, I yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, know, look, it's just. Nano, NaNoWriMo, you know, National Novel Writing Month, every November, I sit down and I write my 50,000 K and you're so proud of yourself. And you're like, I can't believe I broke through that barrier. And thank God I have a whole year to recharge before I do that again. He was doing double that every month casually while also, you know, maintaining other aspects of his very full life. Yeah. I, I, I read somewhere that he, it was, um, what does that work out? To? Yeah. That's 1.2 million words a year. That's just insane. And, and his writing, I mean, I could see Carol Daly doing that because the writing was so sloppy, but this is pretty taut stuff. I mean, it ain't perfect, but, uh, you know, his writing's pretty pretty good. For that volume, I mean, you, you would imagine you're going to have some crap. And and this is what's staggering, too, is that, you know, his it says here in 1926, his agent sold, he sold a million words of gardeners in one year. If he was producing 1.2 million and selling a million of it, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good return um this this is one author who did not uh, uh die in poverty <laughs> like so many of these other noirs uh, we'll see cornell and we'll see uh, uh goodis a little bit later on they, they don't end very well uh not the case for gardner I, mean, I guess he's proof that uh you know most of writing is just getting your ass in the damn chair right he had a he had a good head on his shoulders i think he, he was very calculating in a way that worked well for him career-wise is there anything else you want to say about hell's kettle well yeah a couple things one, I, I like the, the bad guy, the big bad in this uh, is named the full dress kid, which is funny um, because it doesn't evoke fear in me or anything. The full dress kid sort of sounds like, you know, a greenhorn Western cowboy. That's the guy we were supposed to fear. That was a little amusing. And then I had a question. I was sort of like confused by the whole lady of death thing. I wrote, what's her deal? Because there's this lady of death. Who, that's what Ed Jenkins coins her. Because she seems to be around when people die. In one scene, the Phantom Crook opens, he's playing Colonel Grayson and he opens a door to go find the femme fatale, Lena. He opens the door to getting bludgeoned or attacked by a dude. And then the Lady of Death jumps on him and starts whispering in his ear as he falls down and he's getting beaten by another guy. And like she tries to steal his wallet. I thought, is she trying, is she actually poisoning people when she attacks them? Or does she just jump on people who are getting beaten, whisper weird things into their ear and steals their wallets? I didn't understand what the hell was going on there. Yeah, I believe that's a reoccurring character, right? Yeah, they said it was a trilogy, I think. And we're reading like the second story. Yeah, but she's definitely, definitely the mysterious woman who just like, what, what, what? why, is, what's going on? Yeah. Oh, she's leaping on a dude again. I guess he's going to die, but she doesn't have a weapon. It perplexed me. But, you know, that's good. It's something it's like, you know, seeing a quality film like Blade Runner. I, I walk away thinking about things. I'm still thinking about the Lady of Death. 
Do you have anything else to say on this story, or do you want to move on to Horace McCoy? I mean, I, I don't think I have a, a lot more to say. I mean, I, li- I just like the character. I l- enjoyed the pacing of it. Gave me a little bit more information on Earl Stanley, Stanley Gardner, and uh, I enjoyed it for that reason. So I'm good to move on to our, our uh, next selection, which is Frost Flies Alone by Horace McCoy. This is definitely more in the adventure story style of writing than, than we've been reading. And in some regards, it's reminiscent of Charles Williams, but not, but only very briefly. Yeah, I would agree with that just because it's, it's a little bit more, I don't know, specialized in, in the type of story that we're getting. Yeah. You know, like uh, Williams has the nautical noir here. We have Horace McCoy giving us uh a little bit of an aviation detective story. Yeah, because this guy, Horace McCoy, he he was in World War One. He saw action as a bombardier. He was nearly shot down by Germans at one point, and in France awarded him the 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 Cross of War for valor. So he comes he comes to writing as somebody who's already sort of established and heroic in his own experience. This guy's not screwing around when it comes to uh, writing about aviation. So yeah, he was a bombardier and an aerial pilot or aerial photographer, I should say, in World War I. And then, so this is a big, it's a, it's a slow-moving aircraft, um, and it's an easy target. So on August 5th, and fifth, and they don't give the year here, I'm guessing this is late in the war, probably 1918, the observation plane was attacked by four swift German walkers. The pilot was killed, and McCoy had to take over the dual controls. Although twice wounded by machine gun fire, he shot down one of the enemy planes and managed to fly the bullet ridden DH-4 back to its home base. And then that's, for that exploit, that's why he was rewarded the uh, the cross there. So it's, it seems like quite a feat. Yeah, it's pretty badass. I mean, that, that sounds like a, a plot element in one of his uh, Frost stories. For sure. He was um, known for, for the development of this character, Jerry Frost, and several other serialized characters. Like, he was one of the more versatile of, of the Black Mask writers. He would write... The the hard boiled street stuff. He would write this sort of adventure guy uh, with with aviation skills. I think he had a western character. He had he sort of just played his cards all over the place to uh, to keep getting published. And like Gardner, he also was pretty productive. Like he was already sort of a rock star hero from the war. He was a competitive swimmer, an expert tennis player, a flamboyant dandy. And then he did. He learned how to write as a supplement to his income as a sports editor. So he had a lot of things going on. And yet again, here's another pulp author who has a pretty crazy life before becoming an author. And and, and it shows in in the way that he can write stories. And, and no, we'll talk about the story. I didn't love it, but I saw elements in it that I, I really appreciated and I thought uh, were handled well. But McCoy is mostly known and. This was new to me, but I look forward to reading this book. I got it on my shelf right now. They Shoot Horses, Don't They? is the name of of the novel that he wrote that has since become a minor American classic. It's The French, of course, love it. People like uh, philosophers Sartre and de Beauvoir, they loved him. Like He was a rock star in France because of of his experience in the war and his writing. And uh, They Shoot Horses, Don't They? was referred to as the first existential novel to have appeared in America. So in a way that he he becomes really uh, a shaper uh, of noir writing and the sort of existential stuff that we explore, at least on some of our, our, our episodes. But this this Frost stuff that we're reading today, not noir at all. This isn't this isn't noir country. This is more hard boiled adventure stuff. No, but I, I certainly also look forward to reading that uh, they don't they shoot horses, don't they? We'll have to add that. He had another future episode of Point Blank. Oh yes, I, I'm thinking uh, sooner than sooner than forty seven, more like maybe nineteen. Yeah, yeah, I would say so too. But going, getting into this Frost story, Frost Flies Alone, I, I love these air adventure stories. I mean, I you know, as a kid, I love the show Tailspin. Um, there's an 80s TV show called Tales of the Golden Monkey, which is kind of like a crossover of something like this with Indiana Jones in the South Pacific that I, I really love. For those who know either the video game or the tabletop game Crimson Skies, like I just love this this period between World War One and World War Two, the airplanes and the air adventure and the idea of sky pirates and stuff like that. Like I, 
this th that's what really appealed to me about this. I love the integration of the detective story as well, but these these style of air adventure stories, uh, I, I'm a sucker for that. Kind and of it's stuff. definitely McCoy's wheelhouse. His first story was a gaudy South Seas adventure called The Devil Man, and it's a it's an arena he returns to uh, repeatedly. So be fun to see how to what extent he spends his time in that area. The comedy stories that he writes. He looks like he wrote about 15 stories between 27 and 34 for Black Mask. The Devil Man was the first. Frost Rides Alone was maybe the fifth Jerry Frost story, but the rest of his stories for Black Mask were actually all Jerry Frost. So I was wrong in saying that he wrote versatilely for Black Mask. He does write for uh, a couple of publications like uh, Battle Aces, Action Stories, Detective Dragnet, main stories, Western trails. He gets into uh, film writing as well towards later in his career. I think he wrote a uh, hundred, hundred or so screenplays is what I read. So pretty active. Yeah. Although he does die in poverty, doesn't he? You know what? It's funny because in 1951, which this is after his, he's pretty well established. He was born in, I think 1897. So he was in his fifties at the time. He wrote a story called Scalpel, which was so popularly wanted or desired he was able to sell it for $100,000. Really? He was a very famous in France. He sold Scalpel for $100,000. Four years later, he died broke from fatal heart attack. He died broke. So what the hell happened to that money in four years? That's a whole story. Well, I mean, it, it did say in here he liked, uh, you know, he liked planes and fast cars. So you could, you could uh, blow 100000 pretty quickly on yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah, he lived in Hollywood. Yeah, I'm sure he could have he could have gone that route and just blown the money. Uh, but another... In, before we get into the story, another fact of his life was before he arrived to Los Angeles in, in the early 1930s, he was sort of in between. He got divorced and then he moved to L.A. in 1931 from the east. He spent some time as a road bum. I think it was sort of like his uh, his study abroad or, you know, he sort of wanted to live a little diff a little bit differently than his life as a dandy in, in Dallas. So uh, he, I, was, I was wondering... If it, around that time he ran into Jim Thompson, uh, you know, wandering the, wandering the roads, uh, drinking with with Harry McClintock and those folks, uh, would have been an interesting story there. Yeah, that would actually be an interesting piece of like historical fiction is to have a bunch of these guys meet up and. Uh... <laughs> yeah. So, yes. so Frost flies alone. What's the story about? Uh, what do we like about it? Well, you know, just a quick overview. It's again the, the the plot of this is pretty simple. A woman gets kidnapped. Uh, Frost, the flyer, um, has to get in his airplane because the kidnapped woman is on a rum runner, uh, like a fast speedboat kind of thing in the Gulf of Mexico. You now he goes out there in his plane, finds her. There's a twist, um, and then Frost saves the day. I mean, that's kind of the basic rundown of how this thing works. To our audience, if you had any doubt, Frost wins. <laughs> As they almost always do if they're the title character. The story is cool in that it sort of plays with genre in cool ways, crossing genres. It starts in Cafe Estrellita in, across the Mexican border. So we, we have this sort of border action western story. Uh, they're in a, a Mexican cafe. Frost is with a visitor who's a, like a newspaper reporter. And that's the the woman in question, and she is there to interview him because he's so amazing, I think. And then some uh, Mexican hooligans come in, and there's a ruckus, and there's a bunch of fisticuffs and fun action. You know, I'm sure the Black Mask audience ate it up. But what happens is that the woman is kidnapped, and that's that's the promise of the story is that, of course, Ross is going to rescue her. So that was an interesting start because we start in the desert and we end up in the Gulf of Mexico on a plane and on a boat then all all in like 15 pages. So a lot of things happening in the story. Yeah, I think that's what I appreciate about it is, you know, the it's not a necessarily a unique story by any means. And, you know, it's not even necessarily the best read, but it has a nice pacing. It moves quick. It has a number of different locations. Frost is a little bit too cocky or confident for my taste. I, I could leave that. But I kind of look at something like this as like, would this make a satisfying episode of a TV show? Or even, you know, if it was changed a little bit like a cartoon or something like that. And yes, it would. You know, it'd be, be a fun little hour-long story or half-hour story. 
and uh, it would work for yeah, me. Yeah, this is definitely more of an adventure story than I'm used to reading. It's definitely set up to be like it, uh, it'd be good as a television, like a television episode. It sort of have a, has a Lone Ranger quality because the the good guys were in white in a sense and uh, can do no wrong. There's no there's no self doubt in Jerry Frost character, but yeah, I really like the action and the movement in the story. Whereas Terry Mack didn't have movement; it felt sort of stagnant. This one is is flying and it feels very American in that way. It's always racing to the next part uh, in a way that. Uh, just felt felt like classic like 1950s serial adventure one of the other things i like about this piece is that it's like you said it's a crossover type piece of fiction where is this adventure is this actually i mean he is a ranger so he's a police officer and he's solving this kidnapping so it is a, a crime detective story um but we get the integration of of both types of story in one piece as we've explored some of this older stuff, and I've been doing a little bit of the same thing with science fiction and fantasy, some of the older stuff, you see the genre lines being blurred a lot more. I actually think in some ways that makes it better than some of the more hard definitions that can happen with today's fiction. I mean, the better stuff is blurring lines, but a lot of it just gets to be a, almost a cliched, um, you know, fill in the blank kind of story. And, you know, I don't know that... I'm sure that there is a, a detective story out there today that has involves an airline pilot or something of that nature because there's got to be a detective of every possible career you could have out there. But, you know, would it be two-fisted air tail along with a detective piece as well? Probably not. I really love blurred edges when it comes to the genres, and it's really fun when when that happens. Even when it's not executed perfectly, it's nice to see uh, you know, you establish these genres, you sort of set rules for them. And then like any writer or any any master of any craft, once you know how you're what you're doing, once you know how to do it well, then you can break the rules and try to challenge uh, the assumptions about uh, your arena and see if you can push into new territory. And yeah, Frost does that a little bit with the story, it sort of blurs the edges between the adventure, the Western, the the detective. And I love to see that. And I think I'd like to see it more often. I like the best fiction I read when it comes to modern detective is when it's sort of blurry as to whether or not it's a detective story at all. I did make a note while reading this book of, I mean, the sheer volume of these stories, a lot of these authors were just pulling characters from all sorts, any ridiculous career that they could possibly think of. You know, we have in the whole realm of things, a air marshal seems pretty, pretty normal. Um, going back to, to Gardner, I made a note that he has a character called Bob Larkin, who is an amateur juggler. Oh, my God. Uh, yes. Yes. That was great. <laughs> and and also a character um, named Speed Dash, who is known as the human fly, since he's able to climb tall buildings with ease. Nice. And, and a precursor to Spider-Man. <laughs> I guess so. And then uh, and Paul Kane. You know, his character in uh, the story we didn't, you know, in Gun Down that's in the same collection, he's a an ex stunt man who is Doolin. Uh, trying. Yeah, Doolin is an ex stunt man trying his hand at being a detective. So, uh, you know, do all of these careers necessarily work? Uh, maybe not, but I applaud the authors for trying out some bizarre combinations to see what works. Yeah, I'll, I'll certainly tip my hat to anybody who tries to make an amateur juggler a protagonist. I mean, not even a professional, not even like this is just a juggler who's sort of good, but not really like seriously <laughs> as a hero. Yeah, yeah. You know. I can juggle three balls. <laughs> yes. For, you know, a couple minutes, then I'll... <laughs> well, just overall, now that we've had a chance to discuss it, do you have any any final thoughts on the book? I thought it was, it was good because it opened me up in a way that I'm hoping this podcast will continue to do. It exposed me to a few new writers, helped me to understand a little more of the context of the Black Mask, you know, starting off as a quick moneymaker and then becoming a cultural phenomenon uh, and influencer of its own. Uh, there's a quote by Ross McDonald, who we'll get to soon enough as, as an author of the Lewis Archer Detective. He wrote that the Black Mask Revolution was a real one. From it emerged a new kind of detective hero, the classless, restless man of American democracy, who spoke the language of the street. 
I really love this quote. It, it makes uh, it helps clarify for me just how very American this private eye detective ty- style of story is uh, in its emergence in the socio political and historical matrix that was the 30s to 50s. And um, yeah, I, I just I really loved what this book did in terms of opening me up and sort of gave me new avenues to pursue. I thought it was really fun. I'm glad that we did this uh, in episode seven. Am I blown away by the writing in this collection? Not necessarily. But is it incredibly interesting based on the other pieces that we've read and seeing how all, everything sort of connects together? Yeah, it really is interesting from that more, I guess, scholarly reading of the of the work. I would be interested in exploring some of the authors who are lesser known, maybe some of the, definitely some of the female authors who wrote for the magazine. And also, I know there's been a lot of research on pseudonyms and who was writing under under pseudonyms, because that wasn't always necessarily kept track of the best. Sure. We may have some women, we may have some people of color, we may have some people writing that we don't necessarily see the uh, you know the headshot of like Hammett and Chandler and and Gardner for that matter. We do have a list of names, but those names uh, are meaningless without connecting them to a, a story, a face. So yeah, a little a bit of a history project would be fun tracking down some of the origin stories of some of these people and doing a lesser known hard boiled pulp writers episode, episode uh, one hundred and thirty six. Yeah, and if uh, our listeners have any, especially those of you who are highly engaged in this pulp history, and if you have some good resources on some of these lesser-known authors, we would love to hear from you. Uh, you can email us at uh, pointblanknoir at gmail, or you can share them with all the listeners on our Facebook page. That would be really appreciated, and hopefully that'll bring us some some new directions for so it's not just Justin and I uh, finding places and books that we're going to read and talk we about. We love when we hear from our, our fans and our listeners, and we, we have been hearing more, and we hope to re- be responding more consistently to some of the, the conversations we've been having on Facebook and otherwise. So, uh, yeah, if you find anything, pass it on to us. We're going to definitely take it into consideration as we develop this podcast. So. Well, Justin, is there any particular line that was a choice cut for you from this book? There were quite a few lines that that drew my eye, but uh, one I wrote down, I guess I'll stick with. It's from the Gardner story, and uh, that's Hell's Kettle. And it's a short paragraph. I'll read it here. I signed that letter with the picture of a human eye done in red ink. It was the type of letter well calculated to cause uneasiness to a crooked police captain. It was just another monkey wrench in the machinery of gang activities. If I dropped enough monkey wrenches, I'd get action. I like that. I like the monkey wrench reference. I like uh, that it was new and fresh writing. Yeah, that's a good one. And yeah, you're right. Jenkins is basically the monkey wrench in everybody's plans. Okay, well, then that means it's time for Puss Walgreen Award. Puss Walgreen. Well, Justin, it is from Dashiell Hammond, our old, our old pal Dash, mm-hmm. and the story Bodies Piled Up. Dash gives us the character of Porky Grout. <laughs> oh, I can't believe I missed that one. Yes, Porky Grout, and uh, he, you know, he really doesn't serve much of a purpose in the story at all. Just like Puss Walgreen. Yeah, he's there, though. He's there. Porky is there. Porky. We should have a whole spinoff serial on Porky. <laughs> That's right. Porky Grout, amateur juggler <laughs> and paralegal. They're illegal. Oh, I have I have a quote. This porky grout was a dirty little rat who would sell out his family, if he ever had one, for the price of a flop. So porky's undesirable, I guess. A snitch. Yes. Yeah, no, you don't want to tell porky a secret. What do you got? I have one from from this collection, and then I have a bonus one. So we'll start with the collection. This is from the Gardner story, Hell's Kettle. I mentioned it already, but I'll say it again. Here's my drum roll. The Full Dress Kid. I'm sorry, but for a bad guy, this does not inspire fear in me. (laughs) It's just... But he's fully dressed, Justin. I know, he has. he's fully dressed, and that's about it. A a fashionable young person, and I'm supposed to feel fear for my safety. I do not. So that didn't quite work for me. But in terms of a story, character name that comes from a a Dashiell Hammett story called Corkscrew, which came up in my reading, it's a, a story that he writes featuring the Continental Op, and it's set in Arizona. But there's a character in it 
who joins forces with the op temporarily. And he's sort of like a, a rugged individualist. He doesn't want to be a deputy because he doesn't want to have to enforce no laws he don't like, uh, which I thought was sort of cute. So this guy works ambiguously with the op and his name is Milk River. Milk River? Milk River. Okay. Yeah. I mean, how could I turn that one down? It's just no, that's perplexing. Yeah. So there we go. Hammond is weighing pretty heavily in these these choices. It's funny how that works. Well, if if a man who wants to be known as Dash can't give us some good names, then I don't know what the world's coming to. That's true. It's time once again for really stupid mysteries. This week, coming soon to a bookstore near you, Dumpsters of Death. A Suds McGee sanitation worker mystery. The streets are full of filth, and Suds is here to clean up the town. (laughs) I'm trying. (laughs) Why why is he named Suds? I mean, I get get it like the cleaning up, but how does that factor into sanitation? He works, is he like a garbage man? Who who also uses soap? I think he's like a general sanitation. He's like one of those guys with one of the general purpose trucks that's got like a broom and a shovel and you know all right yeah yeah he'll he'll rake some leaves he'll yeah. uh scrub uh scrub graffiti off uh, off a wall and he'll beat up he'll beat up some hoodlums yeah he's kind of like a, a yeah. pulp you know like 1920s era non-toxic avenger yes <laughs> he's like the the superhero of the dump yeah okay i like it so we're going to move on to Subject Unknown. Subject Unknown. Well, Justin, I think this week we had decided we were going to talk a little bit about the short story based on our anthology collection here and a longer form novel or uh, novelette um, that we've read in the past and just kind of just generally talk about what we like and dislike about the different styles, you know, some um, some of the the more craft elements, maybe um, whatever we want to talk about here, just short versus long form. And I do want to say that a little bit of this is a response to some comments that we had um, through social media, actually going back to our episode two, when we discussed Red Harvest uh, by Dashiell Hammett. And as you recall, the main character in that is the Continental Op. We got a little, I don't want to say, I guess, some criticism or whatever, because at least I was not exactly impressed with the Continental Op as a character in a novel. But I really love the Continental Op in the short story version that we read in this collection um, with the bodies piled up. So, you know, maybe discuss a little bit of why that is and uh, do a little back and forth on that. Well, I think it's a good time to do this because this is our first experience on the podcast talking about short stories. We've been going one novel after the next for a a while now. So structurally, short stories and novels are different. They have to be. You can't just stretch out a short story. There are other things that need to be in place in order to give it the staying power of a novel because a novel is far longer. I mean, usually 10 times longer than a story. So one thing that we criticize Red Harvest for is the fact that it sometimes felt like a bunch of stories stitched together in a way that a lot of these black mask writers did because sometimes they would they would write these sort of serialized stories and find a way of tying them together structurally to turn into a novel that they could sell for additional money in, a, in another market and while I, I get that practically sometimes it doesn't pay dividends at least artistically because they're structured so differently what does a short story have to have versus a novel a short story has to have a, a tight plot usually especially in these genre stories, that leads to a single climax the majority of the time. You don't have multiple dips and drops and rises and whatnot because there's simply not enough time. So you got to make it all lead toward one thing, and then that resolution wraps up the story. A novel simply is not stories strung together. They have to have a cumulative effect to the reader and a series of climaxes, sort of like rolling waves, to sort of build you toward that final climax. Another thing that's different about short stories is that you can have one setting in a short story and it's no big deal, but you don't want to have 200 pages of a novel set in a house or set in a room. And of course, certain stylists have pulled that kind of stuff off. But in general, you move around a lot, you change paces, you go to different places, and different scenes sort of keep the 
reader interested. And, you know, Red Harvest did that in that we had this whole city and we got to wander around and see a lot of cool things. In general, you want to make sure that you're mixing it up. A thing about hard-boiled short stories is that they need to dive right into the action. They typically do because that's that's what the that's what it's for. It's for a reader who wants action, and they deal with generally a single setup, like a crime or a caper, and the detective is put on the case or the flying ranger or whoever it is. But you know, right away you know what's up, and the situation gets complicated. The trouble escalates, and the final confrontation comes in ten to twenty pages. Usually, it's defeat for the bad guy and a half victory or a victory for the protagonist. So. Novels obviously have more time to develop. You get to know characters early on. There's, it's just a slower burn in the first 20, 30, 40 pages, sometimes even longer, as you get to know everything about the story and the writer has time to sort of incubate and develop these ideas in your mind. So much of this is just about time and also how quickly you get to the action and then the complexity of the action. And that speaks a little bit to this Dash Hammett story, Bodies Piled Up, which is not very complicated, but it's really precise and exacting and interesting. He, he sort of squeezes a lot of life out of a very simple premise in a way that I, I thought was really, really good and made me appreciate the Continental Op in short story form much more than I appreciate him in, for example, Red Harvest. Yeah, for sure. That's that's my issue with it. And it's not that I don't appreciate Red Harvest as a novel, especially since when we talked about it, we're talking about it as a transition novel. And what I'm reminded of here is another friend of mine recently wrote a, a short piece about what they've learned as a writer. And one of the big points that they make is learning to write short stories first before you start tackling a novel because you can make mistakes in the short story. And, you know, it might that might not be the direction for everyone to do that, but that's what worked for them. I see that really coming through here with the, with this op story. So Hammett, you know, he's been writing short stories for the magazine and they're good. You know, like like we said, this op story in this collection, I thought was solid. You know, you don't need the character development that you need in a novel character is important in a novel. And when he makes that transition to Red Harvest. It doesn't quite work because, like I said, it was published as four pieces. And to me, it feels like four pieces, essentially. And considering its place in the publication history, I'm fine with that because it is it's it's a learning experience. And that's why it's it's a classic novel, even though by maybe standards of today, it's a little bit flawed. We can still learn a lot from that that story, especially when. You know, obviously Chandler did, and obviously he took the step to making it a novel through, well, as you said, a lot more locations, a lot more character development, a lot more plot points, and multiple climaxes throughout the throughout the story. Speaking to Chandler and speaking to my own experience as, as a reader of, of noir and hard-boiled stuff, I think that when I approached the con Continental Op in Red Harvest, I was coming with the prism of the writing of Chandler and of Dash Hammett's Sam Spade, who we'll get to in a couple episodes. So I was thinking of these more developed three-dimensional PIs who can carry a novel better because with a novel, you need a little bit more, the, the plot's more complex. The scenes are more complex. There's more of them. You need to have a character that can stand up to that and is more dynamic and interesting so that you're willing to walk with them through this longer, more difficult story and, and hold your interest. And that's why I felt the continent, continental op black because I felt like he was a step down from these more developed characters. Seeing him from this short story form where, you know, you want a fast, punchy action hero who steps in, solves stuff, is clever, not a genius, but clever enough, uh, strong enough, but just with a little bit of doubt enough so that you feel like he's a little more realistic. And having read this now, I see why the Continental Op can work and work well and why he was so popular, especially in the context of some of the lesser Black Mass stories. You know, looking at Terry Mack and then reading the Con Continental Op, Continental Op looks like he was written by Faulkner, like he's a just, just a work of art. Uh, whereas I don't, I didn't feel that before. Now I understand more contextually why, why he works and why he's a great short story character. Yeah, it's interesting that, you know, here we are, we're only seven episodes into this, uh, the show. And 
both of us obviously were interested in the genre, but by we're no means scholars or experts on the topic. And I'm I'm glad that we're doing this because we are seeing that progression and it, it's becoming very clear as to what the progression is. And it's also interesting to learn with real well with any genre when you go back to old works and read them from a modern perspective, it's always hard to put that lens of, well, this is the stuff I'm reading that's current. This is where it came from. So it's hard to, or I should say it's maybe it's easy to be critical of that stuff. But once you kind of see where, you know, what, what flows into what, then you can certainly gain a much greater appreciation of the progression. Well, I love that. That I mean, that's one of the th- reasons I wanted to do this podcast. It forces me to engage in this world, but also it's fun to see the progression. I mean, we're documenting our deepening understanding of these genres in a way that's really cool. So for those of you who aren't already experts in this stuff and, and know-it-alls, you know, understand that we're learning with you. We're, we by no means are pretending to be like the arbiters of what's what in, in noir and detective fiction. We're, we're just learning as we go and having fun while doing it. And another thing that I'm seeing with, you know, since we were so anthology heavy in today's episodes, it's that the short story works so well as for experimental fiction that we have to, you know, it's hard, again, with that modern viewpoint that these stories that we're reading from, especially this early stuff in the 20s and the early 30s, this is an emerging emerging genre that nobody was writing before. So it's experimental fiction for the time. Now we go forward to a book that I looked at just, you know, in our five round burst for this uh, episode, this just to watch them die. And one of the things that I loved about this is that, again, it's short stories. There's a lot of modern takes on crime fiction in this anthology. So it feels fresh. It feels modern. There's some twists on some of these classic ideas, but it's very much new fiction. I was a little bit worried, not worried, but I I thought when I picked up a collection inspired by Johnny Cash, I was going to get a bunch of stories from the 50s or something. But no, that's not at all what this is. It's talking about the timelessness of his music, but also the timelessness of crime fiction and the short story as a way to push a genre forward and to try new things and to learn. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot, a lot of power there. Yeah. I was really happy when you brought up uh, that, the Johnny Cash anthology, it was edited by Joe Clifford, who uh, got his MFA at Florida International, where I went to school and he's a pretty established uh, noir and, and, and hard-boiled author. And uh, he's finding some success in that field. So we might uh, ultimately re- uh, visit one of his one of his novels down the road. There was another couple people from my program that were published in that book, including Lynn Barrett, who uh, was my thesis advisor and another really good mystery writers and, and plot geniuses. So uh, I think down the road, we might be revisiting some of these works uh, in a different context. Well, thank you once again for joining us for Point Blank. Uh, this was episode seven. And in future episodes, we have uh, a couple of good titles coming up. We have Shoot the Piano Player by David Goodis for episode eight. Night Has a Thousand Eyes by Cornell Woolrich for episode nine. And episode 10 will be the classic The Postman Always Rings Twice by James M. Kane. If you have questions for us, you want to know more about the podcast or who we are, you can go to pointblankpodcast.com. That's our website. If you want to reach us via social media, we have a Facebook page, Point Blank Hard Boiled Noir and Detective Fiction. Look us up. You can also reach us at our Twitter handle, at Point Blank Noir, and we will answer your queries. Also, if you want to talk to us uh, in longer form, you can reach us at our Gmail address, pointblanknoir at gmail.com. We encourage your feedback and we look forward to your questions. Spread the word. You like the show? Go to iTunes and give us a rating. If you know anybody who's into noir or mystery or crime fiction or crime film, you know, tell, tell them about the podcast. Listeners, spread the word. See you next time. See you next time, folks. Point Blank is under a Creative Commons license. Music is by Justin. Copywritten works are property of their respective holders.